Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the RTS Christmas lecture, though it turns out it's more of a Christmas interview. Uh, my name's Chris Curtis. I'm the editor-in-chief of Broadcast, and I'll be talking tonight to David Abraham about a media career that spanned three decades. David co-founded ad agency St. Luke's. He moved to Discovery, first in the UK and then the US, returned to run UK TV, and won the race to become Channel 4's chief executive in 2010. He then swapped being a broadcasting boss for being a production startup with his new venture, Wonderhood Studios. So there's plenty to get stuck into, uh, and there'll be time at the end for questions, so put your thinking caps on. Um, but we're going to begin at the beginning, and we're going to begin with a clip. Uh, David, would you like to introduce your first brush with television? My first brush with television was to be in a documentary. Um, it was a in instructive and slightly painful uh, experience, as this clip is about to show. <laughs> this is There was actually a cutting edge documentary on Channel 4. It's funny because I, I thought know. it was Nathan Barley actually. But, um, <laughs> what, well, I was young. You were young. You were young. <laughs> oh, my first question then, as is evidence, St. Luke's was a relatively unconventional ad agency. It was employee owned, you was an M it was an MBO. There was you were trying something from the outset in a slightly 90s kind of way. There was something around motivating staff and trying to get people to think differently about their jobs. 
Absolutely. I mean, we, we, we sort of basically chucked every sort of bit of management theory at it, um, including ownership, which was really radical. It was the only employee-owned advertising agency in the world. And there was a really curious um, connection between the motivation that that unleashed on the work, which was very original. I mean, this was for several years, it was the most successful ad agency in the UK and was sort of being talked about internationally. But it sort of brought out both the best in people, but also the worst, because it became really ungovernable once you got to about 200 people, really. It was absolutely impossible to make any decisions whatsoever. So the sort of kibbutz nature of it um, became quite useful once I got to Channel 4. There was a suggestion, I believe, that they had to have a big team meeting about what kind of... To, what kind of cereal to serve in the office for it breakfast or whatever. It became a complete nightmare. Yeah. We sort of painted ourselves in ideologically into this corner that we couldn't get out of. But from the beginning in your career then, you were interested in trying to do things a bit differently, in management culture, and you know maybe that comes with a few extremes that in, in hindsight might not... Be, but there's something there around yeah. you trying to sort of slightly push at the boundaries a little bit around perceived wisdoms. Yeah, I think if you, if you, it's always been my experience that if you surround yourself with very talented people, if you're in the creative industries, creative thinkers, and try and find new geographies, new ways of organising, uh, or fresh ways to, to, to interact, then that will have a positive effect on, on, on the product you're creating. And that was, I, I did learn an awful lot, um, which was a bit more serious than that clip shows. Uh, there was a Harvard Business Review article that written about the company. I mean, we were, we were really on a journey to understand how to become a high-performing, competitive creative company. And was the pre-recession advertising industry a fun place to work? Was it opulent? Were there long lunches? Well, and we weirdly, it was, as you say, it was quite a kind of, it was feet on the ground type of environment. We didn't have our own corporate offices. We, you know, it, it was weird now to look at that phone system, that the mobile phone sort of wasn't in, the, in our lives at that time. We were experimenting with fluid ways of uh, using office space and an office that looked a little bit more like a, a nightclub in, in the 90s. Obviously, that scene was big. Uh, and now every, every office looks like that. Then it was... I'm not sure every office has bunk beds, actually, but... <laughs> Google, they do. <laughs> the Google, yeah. they do. Very good. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the formation of St Luke's was um, partly a response to... Merger, a major consolidation. That's right. There were two. There were, there, we were part of a company called Chiat Day that was a, a very respected Californian ad agency that worked with Apple, helped launch the Apple Macintosh in 1984. They would developed a business in London. The founder, Jay Chiat, sold the business uh, to one of the big holding groups, Omnicom. They wanted to merge our office with another company called TBWA. Mm -hmm. There were client conflicts, and that led to myself and that guy Andy Law going to New York, I was I think 32 at the time, and a organising a management buyout. And we organised it on um, what was called a, a, a set price but an earn out, so we were not having to bring capital in to right. own the business, we were, uh, we, we were earning out against a fixed price, which we did very, very quickly because we grew the business. So that led to the, an interesting question about who owned the company, and we felt all of the employees, there were about 35 of us that started it, mm -hmm. and about nearly 175 by the time I left five years later, um, that, that it was an opportunity to create a business that was owned by, in, the, in the form of a trust, an employee share ownership trust, of which there are quite a few in the UK, and John Lewis is a version of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, because we're going to talk about your, your career this evening, does the decision to create St Luke's um, in response to um, a desire for corporations to merge, does that foreshadow a little bit some of your thoughts around consolidation and the creative industries that, that have played out? Is that, or am I being, is that too psychoanalytical? Well, you're the journalist, so uh, it, 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 it could do. I, I don't know. I was just there was something there about you thinking, I'm not sure I want to work in an environment where the, the, the company I work for has been bought by a company and it's going to merge me in with another business there, and a, you're going to lose a sense of identity or motivation or something. Definitely, there was, that was part of it. I think also um, the ad industry, like the TV industry, is, is very dominated by American ownership and yet the creativity of the UK and London is 
globally recognized and respected. So there was a little bit of that, oh, we have been part of this American thing and we can go out and do our own thing uh, independently. And also, you've got to remember, I started work in 1984. And in 1984, the ad industry in London still felt like Mad Men, circa kind of late 70s. You know, there was, there was a lot of cigars and cigarettes in meeting rooms and uh, a lot of whiskey being drunk. And it was a totally different era. So as a young person, I, my first experience of work was very different to the culture that emerged in the 90s that yeah. St. Luke's was part of. Okay, interesting, good. Um, we'll return to some of those themes later on. Your move then was your first move into television. Uh, you went to work at Discovery um, in 2001, Discovery in the UK, with some responsibility for Europe, and then later on to Discovery in the States. This was kind of the brave new world of multi-channel TV. Yeah, and it point. happened um, partly because St. Luke's had won um, the contract to do the advertising for Sky just as it was going digital. Okay. So I remember our brief was, you know, the British nation is used to five channels at that point. Channel 5 was still quite young. Mm -hmm. And it's going to go from five. And I remember someone coming to say that when you get the Sky box, you can have 30 channels. And it was, so, you know, it was again, like the mobile phone moment, it was such a mind-blowing thing to be sort of part of the process of explaining that proposition to the nation. And as a result of that, I, I sort of began to become very involved with, um, uh, with the channels that, you know, were being provided. And that's how I met the Discovery, um, the people running Discovery. The type of programming you were, you were sort of ushered in at Discovery, in many ways, when we look back on it now, it shares quite a lot in common with public service broadcasting content? Well, again, that was a really special moment. John Hendricks, um, the founder of, of Discovery, um, was still very much at the centre of the mm -hmm. business, and he had done a JV with the BBC um, at that time, um, which was like a you know, really visionary um, co-production arrangement, which effectively took the best of the PSB content from the BBC and, and projected it into America. So weirdly, we were then part of a team that was selling the discovery proposition as a multi-channel proposition back in the UK, a bl blending American content with some, some beginning to commission stuff from the UK. And it was, again, a, looking back on it now, a, a pretty inf informative experience to join that organisation as 9-11 happened. Um, and, you know, people think less of it now because you think of the Twin Towers... But, uh, you know, a plane went into the Pentagon, and I remember we were on a conference call with Washington that day, mm -hmm. uh, and, and there was sort of smoke visible through the video conference call. So it was, and, and then everyone should try to respond to that event through the medium of documentary, and it, it sort of put, in a sense, put television right at the very centre of, of events. So it was kind of an extraordinary thing to, to be, for the first time, in telly but that year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there were shows, you know, I'm thinking about things like Little People, Big World, and the, um, the uh, Skin Deep, the Anita Roddick uh, show, yeah. that are kind of in that, uh, operating in that space. I, I guess part of what we're doing here is looking back, and that these are things that might not have been out of place on, on, on sort of Channel 4. Yeah, I mean, I think the, there's been various waves of multi-channel television sort of, you know, uh, competing uh, in quality and ambition terms with the best of the established channels. And this clip, <clears throat> which we're going to show, it's, it's quite moving in a number of ways. So Anita Roddick had been a client of mine at St. Luke's. Uh, and uh, a friend of mine, Vadim Jean, the filmmaker, and I approached her when I got to Discovery about doing a documentary series in which she would sort of go undercover as, an, as a, a homeless person, live homeless for five nights, as a fat person in a fat suit going around London and her rea the reactions that people mm -hmm. had to her. Uh, and, th and this episode, which was when she was an, uh, made into an old lady. And in this scene, which is terribly moving now, looking back on it, because this is three or four years before Anita knew that she was seriously ill, um, she is, is, is fully um, disguised as an elderly lady, and she goes to see her own mother, who's this brilliant uh, Italian uh, 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 East Ender, who you'll, you'll meet now in this clip. Very good. The big jungle wasn't there. No, it was a big jungle. Mm -hmm. You knew you were early, early. <laughs> 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 so competitive, Papa. You knew you were early, early. You were there, you were such a good lady, such a good lady. You were soft, you were soft, soft. And you were going to say, and my cough's nice. And when I say they had a special oil that they put on, where's she going to do it here? I'm going to take it off here. <laughs> 
That's never on your skin. That's not. I used to She would have done for Celebrity Goggle Box, I'd say. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, ironic. Um, so th this is your first taste of being working in a broadcaster, of <clears throat> ordering content, you've moved out of the advertising world, possibly the first time in your career that someone says to you, what do you know about making programmes? You're, you're, a, you're a suit, you're an ad man. Something that's been chucked at you from time to time? Yeah, no, it's a fair, it's a fair cop. Um, at that point, I, that, that was what I was known for. But um, I was always at the creative end of of TV um, and had had various sort of interactions with the TV world at St. Luke's. I remember Alan de Botton came in and made one of his um, series in, in association with St. Luke's. So it's, there's a kind of always an interesting overlap. I always remember that IKEA Chuck Out Your Chintz campaign was happening at just about the time that, um, that changing rooms sort of really started to affect lifestyle mm -hmm. uh, programming and, and we started to watch a lot more programs about the home. So there's, there's always been this brilliant sort of cultural exchange between the two worlds um, that I've, I've enjoyed. And do you think TV as an industry is becoming more accepting on an executive level of outsiders? I'm thinking about, you know, Charles Allen or never quite, you know, the, the caterer never being never being accepted. Now we've now got a situation where the boss of ITV is, is a former EasyJet executive, albeit with lots of experience at the, at, at the Guardian. Is telly better now, do you think, about accepting people? Does it still want to put people in, in boxes? Well, of course, telly's a business and ITV's a PLC, so you need an experienced business person to do that. But I've, I've always been in a slightly different sort of hybrid space, I suppose, which is sort of, um, you know, the commercial end of creativity. Um, and I, to be honest, I never really experienced um, that kind of prejudice per se. Uh, and I think it's fair to examine people, for, if they do come from a different part of the industry, examine properly what their, their motivations and skills are. And I think, I hope that I proved over the years in my direct working with program makers that I had the right kinds of insights to, to help to support what they were doing. And you move from Discovery being based in London to, to the States, which sort of catapults your career up another, another notch. Yeah, that was a sort of scary moment because Jaina Bennett had run TLC very successfully. Funnily enough, she took Changing Rooms to America sure. and, and made it into Trading Spaces and it was one of the biggest cable hits in American history. It made literally billions of dollars and like a lot of these hit shows and this was a bit of a theme of my subsequent experience it sort of it went up and it just collapsed and so there was a crisis in the network and at that time Jane Root had just been asked to go and run Discovery in the US Pat Young had been asked to go and run uh, the Travel Channel and Muggins here was asked to go and try and sort out TLC which I 
I did, and that was just a freaky experience. Suddenly I was, I was running a cable network in 90 million homes, having only really been in telly for, at that point, three years, I think. And this show <laughs> was my first bit of luck, and you do need luck. Uh, I remember sitting in a, uh, a commissioning meeting, and this was a relevant experience for when I arrived at Channel 4. So you'd had this big hit. It literally was hundreds of hours on the schedule. It was worth hundreds of millions of dollars and it just had collapsed because they'd over overextended it. And so you, it's all about development. It's like, where are your new shows? And I remember sitting in a development meeting and there was a little clip of this show that someone quietly spoke about in the corner of the room and I went, oh, that's pretty interesting, tell me more. And we launched this as a big marketing campaign and it became a big hit and we had you know, dozens of seasons. And the great thing about America is, I remember they said to me on my first week in the job, you know, David, you're used to commissioning you know, four or five hours at a time, ten maybe, but, you know, you need to commission. I needed to commission something like 50 hours in my first week just to have something for the upfront that was coming up in a few weeks after that. So industrial scales of production, mm. the depth of production, particularly in L.A., when you scale a show up, you talked about Little People, Big World, that went up to 150 episodes or something, you know, just extraordinary. You could have a show on for sort of 52 weeks in the year. So it's almost like everything you've got is like EastEnders or kind of Holby City. It's on that scale, mm -hmm. which is an extraordinary thing to be part of. Did you enjoy it, working in the States? Professionally, I did. It was a, it took, it, I took a big kind of hammering on my marriage, but um, it, it, was, it was an extraordinary um, thing to be... To, to, and also to watch the UK factual industry coming across... I mean, you know, we were, we were basically waking up in, in the East Coast and looking at the, the ratings of Channel 4 and, and the BBC and picking all the shows that were working and literally people were getting on planes within 24 hours and coming and selling versions of those shows. So it was a really brilliant time to sort of see how the industry, the, the UK industry, was, was interacting with the US and, and winning. Yeah, there's a lot of non-scripted, yeah, that I mean, sort of non-scripted revolution, really, that the, the, yeah, the, the I mean, cable... Yeah, I had what not to wear on, 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 the, on the network. We were working with BBC Studios a lot in New York, uh, and every time there was, a, you know, Bear Grylls or whatever was going on, we would try and get it on. I remember a show, the, bo the Boy Whose Skin Fell Off on, on TLC, I showed Jamie Oliver on TLC. It was, it was an amazing time. Some, uh, some hints there at your future uh, uh, career path. But the, the job you returned to the UK for was to run UK uh, TV, a chief executive uh, job. But it, it strikes me, <clears throat> I don't know, you were, you were in the States, you were part of the big discovery machine. UK TV was an opportunity for you to take a chief executive job to, to, to run a broadcaster. But a, a broadcaster that at the time was probably slightly... Old-fashioned, a little bit dusty. Is that fair? Um, not, not completely. No, I mean Dick Emery had set that business up. It was a flex tech joint venture with the BBC. That a lot of private capital had gone into it, and it had been a great success. Um, the brief I was given by the then board, that was John Smith at Worldwide and Malcolm Wall of Virgin Media, as it had become, was to sort of, you know, effectively kind of try and um, uh, reboot. The, the portfolio of channels creatively because the real estate play had played out. You know, they'd mm -hmm. got the number of oh, nine channels by then. So that whole preceding period was about real estate, shop yeah, front. You've got to yeah. keep getting more and more mm -hmm. slots. Uh, and, then, and then it becomes about, you know, entertaining people and marketing it well. And that's sort of when I, when I came in and, and, and we had this mad idea. So let's talk about um, Dave. So, um, at the time, I remember a lot of people were convinced it was a lousy idea. A lot of people well, John were... John Smith actually threatened to fire me in my first board meeting, because he, he said that... So, a tense first board meeting. It was very tense. Be uh, because... Let's explain that. I mean, he, he didn't really threaten to fire it, you. It was properly tense, um, and it was, a good, it was a good example of how my 17 years in advertising gave me the confidence to make that call, because it was... Um, pretty extraordinary, the research. I, I kept saying to the team, we're not going to do that. That's crazy. Or call it Steve. Steve North still runs the channel. And I, I was very keen for it to be called Steve. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, but every time we did the research, and we did all this quant and qual research, mm -hmm. it's sort of, if you want a TV channel to have the persona of the schedule that, it, that we had, which was 
summarised by this, this concept of the Homer Woody banter. And if you said, who was the bloke in the pub who personified that? Dave was like three times more <laughs> in, 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 in the recall and in, in, the, in the sort of affinity than any other name. And so we couldn't get away from it. So it then gave the comments to say, well, let's go with what, the, the, you know, what those insights are telling us. And, and then Red Bee did a great job on the branding. And um, Two things occurred to me. One is that at the time you were accused of naming it after yourself, but I must admit, I don't think I've ever heard anyone call you Dave. People do. My kids do. Do they? So it's annoying me. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I wonder about is we haven't really seen a, a too many channel brands since. I mean, so the perceived wisdom was this thing. Kate Bulkley's Neil didn't. She wrote a column for Broadcast saying what a lousy idea this was. Um, Did and you? That, okay. And that, um, and I that remember it would. That. And that it would that it would uh, fail. So. Um, uh, it was effect, also effective the insight that, from broadcast there once again. Um, it was also the moment that Dave Cameron was coming on the scene and he was called Dave. There was all, I remember Aronovich wrote this really serious article about the, the name and mm. it just somehow got into the zeitgeist and it's always really fun when that happens. You know, you can't predict it. My slightly serious question, because I like a slightly serious question, is we haven't really seen too many channels since then in a, in a similar vein. Not channels, but there have been brands, haven't there? I think this sort of anthropomorphic branding has, has sort of emerged in other, in other spaces. But yeah, it was a, it was a complete one-off. And the brilliant thing about it is it was a cracking business success. I mean, we took a channel, I think it was called UKTV G2. It was behind a paywall. There was some brilliant strategic thinking about giving it a free-to-air uh, slot. Uh, getting this branding uh, and, and some, you know, putting some intelligent acquisitions. Because there was very little, there was no commissioning, I think, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was reheats. I mean, it was, in a sense, it's kind of marketing, um, d demonstration of the power of marketing, that you can get people to sort of reappraise things, but also... I'd say smoke well. and mirrors. You'd say the power of marketing. It's and the, and the, the power same, of branding. It's the same thing. And, and, and distribution, availability, yep. and yep. understanding how to, how to actually get something yep. to its audience. And... Um, as I think most people know, that is the most valuable asset that UK TV have in the portfolio and, and subsequently assisted Virgin's valuation when they sold to scripts and all of that. I mean, so this was an economic success. And do you, I'm, I'm trying to edge you towards saying broadcasters are lousy at branding and they should take more risks because if you look at Dave, there's an example of something that you can... You can, you can I, sort of... I, I don't know whether you can say that, and I've obviously tried... I've done so many different things in the channel brand, but there was an era of channel branding as real estate was the thing, mm -hmm. and then subsequently I think it, my, my, my attention sort of moved and my focus moved much more to building blocks of content and mm -hmm. brands within channels and how those content brands fit snugly with the proposition of a channel brand, which is certainly what I've tried to take with me to Channel 4. Very good. Two more things on, on, on UK TV. You began its push into original content, but you also rebalanced a little bit in terms of free and pay. And that's been something that the, the, there was a time a few years ago where it felt as though free-to-air television had become very old-fashioned and that the future was all pay. And yet, if you look at when we're talking about Discovery, Discovery is now absolutely a sort of hybrid model and the, the, the notion of free and pay and a, and a rebalance there, a broadcaster being healthy that has a foot in both camps, something that, that sort of came about, uh, in, it was realised. Yeah, in and that it period. was, you know, a big debate at the board about whether that was a really big risk and whether it would, um, it would collapse the relationship with the pay, uh, the pay platforms, particularly with Sky. Um, but given the scale of content provision that the BBC was supporting, there was a way of um, segmenting the content and, and sort of providing a meaningful proposition in pay and free and other subsequent businesses like Discovery followed suit. And I think there are some echoes of sort of how we're now going with background, the same thing with Britbox and other things. That, okay, how are we slicing this content up and, and, and maintaining as much value as possible? And your take as a former UK TV chief executive on BBC Studios, as it now is, taking full ownership of that business and what opportunities or challenges that that might bring with it? We've well, got to remember it's now a long time since I was at UKTV, but, it, but I think there's a sort of industrial logic to, to that now sitting within the BBC's sort of portfolio, given how central they are to the provision of the content. Okay, okay, good. Um, let's move on to um, 
the part of your career that in some ways has attracted the most attention and I, we'll spend a good chunk of time discussing. Uh, in 2010, you become Chief Executive of Channel 4. Um, I doubt many people, what's it like interviewing to become Chief Executive of Channel 4? What's that, what's that process like? Well, remember it's snow. I mean, I've laminated my CV. I don't know if that's <laughs> going to, is that going to cut it or what? It was, what's, it, what's it, what's kind of, how much work, do you tell us about that? There was, yeah, there, I mean, someone said to me, in the headhunting world, but if, you, if you're serious about that job, David, don't just sit there and imagine that it will just fall in your lap. It, uh, it, it is a competition. There were lots of very good people who, who, who competed for it. And so I, I did try and sit down and, and have a plan. Um, and the big challenge at that point was, was obviously around um, the debate about the sustainability of Channel 4, which mm -hmm. comes around almost every decade. It happened in my 2001, I remember the RTS. I think I referred to this. In 2001, there was a debate about, will Channel 4 still, uh, still survive in 2010? So there I was in 2010 interviewing, uh, and the whole thing was about, was the model sustainable? People were very anxious about, the, about Big Brother coming off the schedule, which mm -hmm. had echoes of that whole um, trading spaces uh, experience. And when there's hundreds of hours coming off a schedule, it's bloody scary. It's like an engine coming off, the, you know, not mm -hmm. off an airplane because you're just looking at the overnights wondering where's that audience coming from. So that was a very immediate thing. Uh, the channel had made a commitment to the Paralympics. No one knew what that was. I had 24 months to plan for that. Um, so there was quite a lot to talk about in the interview. There's a recession. Well, we were, yeah, we, we had, yeah, been through a horrible recession and it wasn't at all clear where, whether it was going to um, ease or not. Or the extent or to which what. the ad market was going to come back. Yeah, no yeah. one really knew, both when Adam and I got our jobs, um, and n neither of us knew how lucky we, we, it would prove to be that we, we sort of arrived at a time when the ad market did come back. But it took a while, because both ITV and Channel 4 had cut uh, quite drastically during that period. And you took the decision to put away the begging bowl. The, 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 the starting point was that Channel 4 was no longer going to ask for a portion of BBC Worldwide, or as, as was, or that to, was the, uh, the, the merger yeah. with Channel 5. There were all sorts of, sort of yeah. quite radical solutions yeah. being posed. Yeah. And your strategy was to say, no, we're going to go it alone. We said, we're going to cut our cloth. And I think, you know, uh, um, and I was very fortunate to have a great chairman, Lord Burns, who just got the chairmanship just before I, uh, you know, he had to then appoint me. So we were sort of in it together. And... I just believed that if Channel 4 could perform strongly creatively, that it was going to be strong commercially. And then we would address issues of digital challenges sort of as we went through, but it was in that order. I also had a view that um, Channel 4 selling its own airtime on its own wasn't sustainable. And mm -hmm. I'd already, there'd already been some talks about UK TV's ad sales coming over to, to Channel 4, which allowed it to have more bulk and therefore defend its position uh, in a market that was... So you lined that up while you are at UK TV, then you moved to Channel 4 and said, I think we should take the UK I TV. I say, <laughs> it was not lined up, but it was, it was something that was strategic, a strategic possibility. It had to happen, and there yep. was a, quite a lot of resistance on either side to making it happen, but people forget the Scripps deal was contingent on an ad sales solution, so I would sort of... Yeah, and it, UK TV needed a new ad, uh, sales yeah. house, and so... Yeah. Um, so, strategic challenges, creative challenges at that time. Strategic challenges, I've written down digital and data, and creative challenges, I've, re I've written replacing the irreplaceable Big Brother. So let's... I think that's... The programming bit's a bit more exciting. But digital and data, you know, you're, these were things that were engaging you from a strategic point of view. Yeah, and again, I, um, the brilliant team, um, we, we sat down and in that first few months we worked out that we needed to have a direct relationship with the audience and we had to work out how to create that route and that led to what was sort of loosely termed the data strategy, was the first broadcaster in the world to have a registration up ramp uh, which has subsequently obviously allowed all of the broadcasters to, to, to have an intelligent rela streaming relationship with their viewers that has also, in Channel 4's case, helped to drive um, a, a premium on the, on, on, the, on the growth of the revenue as well so, through targeting. Mm -hmm. So all of that is easy to summarise many years later, but when we started to do it, we actually the, the technology wasn't there. Mm. Um, you know, you've got to remember that streaming was still about buffering uh, in 2010. 
It wasn't that we were sitting in rooms looking at sort of things doing that. It wasn't that long. I mean, when all four launched, it was a pay-per-view proposition. The very, yeah, very that was before, yeah, before the, you joined. The, the, there were various iterations that Andy had tried. There was pay-per-view, and uh, but the AVOD model was essentially there, um, and the archive approach w was there. But there was no uh, there was no attribution, and so we created the data layer. Uh, we were the first people in Europe, Europe to use the Amazon cloud, which is now obviously kind of generic to all these kinds of tools. And um, it was an amazing project. And I remember being quizzed, you know, well, how many people will you get to register? And I'm, I said, well, I think, I think within five years we can get to three million or something, you know. And, um, Fucking a number. Yeah, because we just didn't know. And we got to, I don't know, Sarah's there. Where do we got to? Ten million in, it's 20. Um, and that's, for me, part of the birthright of a public service broadcaster to have that direct relationship with identified users of its services. And we're now in a situation to throw forward. I mean, we've got the situation with the BBC talking about iPlayer as the front door of the BBC. This is absolutely, for, for the PSBs now, I presume it's your take on it would be that actually their, their online viewing is absolutely essential to their yeah, I think Yeah, I think we're in an inter intervening period now where where Linear is still, you know, properly strong and, and, and it sits alongside all these other services. But I think by the time, you know, my kids of my age, you know, it, it, we're just not going to have terrestrial technology in the way that we've got it now because we'll, we will have solved the, the final buffering frontier, uh, whether it's 5G or whatever is coming. But, you know, some regulators in the future will be sitting there going, well, we, we can switch this off now. Mm. Um, and it, so, so, so these services therefore will become, now it, it's not something I see happening in the next five, seven years, but once you get to a 10 year type horizon, I, it seems inevitable. And do you feel, this is a bit of a big picture question, do you feel as though the point at which IPTV as a delivery mechanism is the norm, that that necessarily means the end of linear? No, I, I think that we will still enjoy in many different, but it will be distributed through uh, IPTV. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But I still think the schedule, the scheduled, you know, whether it's the flexi schedule, but I still think that more passive way of consuming curated content will have a very important role, not least because of news and, and, and entertainment. Internet and, delivery and doesn't necessarily mean purely no, on demand. No, 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 because a lot of us are already watching live TV through, through streamed media. It's mm. just that... Uh, a lot of the, obviously, the structures that protect the big PSBs mm -hmm. in that environment fall away. Mm. It's quite interesting that a lot of the new emerging streamers that are either launching at the moment or about to launch are, with the exception largely of Netflix, a lot of them are starting to play with scheduled drop of content, yeah. trying to create an appointment yeah. to view around and on. Yeah. So dropping a, an episode a week yeah, at like a, certain, a certain time. The irony is the morning show, you can't, you can't binge watch it. You're having to wait till Friday night to get to the next episode. It's actually a really good show if you're in the TV business. Uh, I'm enjoying it hugely. Are you a, you're a fan of Apple TV, David? I don't know if you, do you know anyone that works there? Or? I, I think the morning show is a great I've got show. I've one of those watches for Christmas. So. <laughs> I if haven't if got an Apple watch. David can put in a, a, a word. Um, let's talk about the channel. You chat. can always hear the Kate Barkley laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's so distinctive. Let's, it's because my gags are good, David. Um, <laughs> Uh, oh, thank you. Um, the, the creative challenge of replacing Big Brother. This was a... This was a it's probably scary. Yeah. I mean, it, Jay and I were... You know, there were many weeks where we sat in rooms really very frightened that, you know, had, had, this, had this project been left too late. That mm -hmm. was the debate in the industry, you know, how much creative renewal had been prepared mm -hmm. by the preceding team. The fact is we did inherit... It was almost a mission impossible, though. You're not... Because I think that you, no one could have conceived of a show, or even three or four shows. You, 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 you're always going to need a, a big slate of, yeah. of, of, of content to replace that many hours, and the natural ratio of hits and misses means exactly. that it's... Exactly, and I think the TLC experience was a sort of baptism fire that was quite useful because it's all about development, and then it's all about the team, and it's all about being pretty bold and backing the things that you think you can scale up and understanding how to scale things, um, which is not easy um, because often you're backing things that, um, you know, that don't grow, mm -hmm. and, and everyone remembers that that first couple of years was really properly hard, and there were, there were moments where the industry was 
doubting that the team was going was gonna to pull through. Um, and 2013 was, was probably the most critical year because the first half of it was at the sort of lowest there. But we, funnily enough, because the Paralympics had been a great success and that had sort of mm -hmm. given us sense and momentum, but we still didn't have the schedule rebuilt. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we launched, launched Stand Up to Cancer straight after 2012 as well. So we had a couple of things that we knew were building the brand proposition, mm -hmm. had a positive effect on the brand, but we didn't, didn't have the volume of shows until the second half of 2013. And from a management point of view, you had, during your time at Channel 4, an incredibly close, supportive relationship with Jay. Because in 2013, the, the, the heat was on, really. The pressure, well, the the pressure was, was on. The heat was on the whole team. And I think because I you know, run a network and commission shows and, and understood the difficulty of finding new hits. Um, I, I, and because I also I knew what was in the pipeline, mm -hmm. um, I, I was very confident that we were going to make it. But it was, it was properly hard. And, and when also you're sort of in a spotlight like the industry and the, and the industry's got a lot of expectations on you and you know you're trying to serve the indie sector and there's hundreds of people's livelihoods at stake. I mean, it's, it's a really, it's a massive responsibility. Was that simply a case then of keeping the faith, basically? That More than faith. I, you know, we'd been planning, you know, Jay, Jay arrived at the end of my first year and then we'd been planning, um, you know, she always says I was tap dancing through my first year, it was probably fair. Um, but we, 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 were, we, we were building building blocks mm -hmm. and we were moving money between genres and we, you know, we were, okay, the money was coming back in the ad market. We were, you know, we were moving money out of the big brother pipe yep. into yep. these other You had a dividend, gave, effectively. We had a sort of dividend. Yeah. We gave a massive amount of money to Shane Allen in comedy. That led to things like Black Mirror. You know, so you sort of see all these seeds that, that take, you know, two to three years, really, to sort of come through. But you know, at the start, you've got the team that can deliver. But you um, needed, or you took the decision, or you, you needed to stand absolutely shoulder to shoulder with Jay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, li listen, neither of us would have survived had the, had the network not started to deliver the hits that came, and then they came, and they came, and they came. Mm. And then we were able to do really bold things like Formula One and, and Bake Off towards the end. But it was because she'd run BBC One, so she knew what she was doing. She knew how to rebuild a schedule. And I also, I think, understood what risk-taking is and giving people space. So if my job was partly to create that space in which people could go off. And it was an amazing... Jay surrounded herself with amazing people. You know, Piers is now running drama mm -hmm. at the BBC. Shane, uh, you know, um, Phil Clark. These were extraordinarily uh, talented, insightful, creative people who, who worked together for several years to sort of, you know, to, and stuck with it. Mm. And obviously Ralph and yep. the way he led all of the documentary teams. So David Glover commissioned a show called Gogglebox, which amazing, helped change the narrative amazing. a little bit. And people forget, you know, David Glover did a show, I remember, called The Audience, mm. which I loved. There's like 50 people following. I think there's still three episodes of The Audience that have never played out, actually. Yeah. I don't know, I'm probably, I could be wrong. <laughs> I, but, could, I could be wrong. This is very niche. Sorry. Be, yeah, <laughs> because, because the audience was a really interesting show, but it was one of those kind of noble failures. But, you, you know, you could learn from it. Mm. And I think I'm sure that experience helped David to then... Um, Gogglebox know, and the Educating franchise were crucial shows in... They were in that year. And then we had... One from a, then, well, well, we had the Mill. The yeah. Mill, do you remember? The, yep. the, 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 you yep. know, the, and a lot of them were, were the sort of... High, cross-genre commissions, you know, The Mill was a documentary that was a drama, mm -hmm. Gogglebox was commissioned by a specialist factual team, you know, so that we were, I think Jay was really starting to get into a groove of, again, this whole thing about cross-fertilising people, getting into work in, in new ways. She created this breakfast, which created a lot of energy, um, and then by 2014, we were Channel of the Year again. Very good. We need, um, I want to talk politics with you, but I want to rattle through a couple of quick things first. You took the decision to buy Bake Off, which obviously has played out to be a very sound commercial decision. Do that was another very scary moment. Do you still think it was appropriate in terms of Channel 4's remit and, and, and I do, because, poaching it? Because a, a basic, Bake Off um, was leaving the BBC. We didn't make that happen. It was, it was going to happen, and it was either going to go to ITV or it was going to go to Netflix, uh, and that would have hurt us. Um, and so, and it was because of the creative relationship between Richard and Jay, that we, you know, how we would nurture the show. And I think what we demonstrated is rather brilliantly that um, we understood how to refresh the show. And again, 
when you have a hit, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a real dilemma to understand and make the decision about how to keep it fresh. And I think the audience obviously felt that, that they could fall back in love with the show for another few years as a result of the changes that were made. So on every level, that was brilliantly executed, although I think Jay and I were the only people in the country for a few days that thought it was a good idea. Uh, and, and are you still comfortable, with just, just very recently, Channel 4's taken Taskmaster from UK TV or two yeah. former... That's like what, my world's collided, what, any, a, a, a view on that? Again, I look, I think it's the market, isn't it? You know, it's a great piece of IP. Um, it has a market value. Um, you know, I'm now an independent producer, so I can entirely understand that um, how difficult it might must be difficult from a, a loyalty point of view. But you know, it, 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 you know, producers of programmes have to have to find the value of their IP. Sounds like you work at Avalon. Um, let's talk. Let's talk politics, industry politics, government politics. Uh, you gave the McTaggart in 2014. Um, it caused a stir at that time. There is a narrative that says you got up and delivered a McTaggart that put you at odds with your supply base at Channel, at Channel 4, thinking about things like terms of trade and some of your views around consolidation. It, looking at it now, what, what, what would your take on that, on that be? So 2014 was interesting because we knew there was a general election coming. Um, we were beginning to get a sense that ownership and privatisation would come back round. It hadn't been sort of on my agenda for those first five years, but it was a sense to mm -hmm. we picking up that it would come back into play. Uh, and there had been a massive sort of gold rush of acquisition and consolidation. Obviously, ITV had, had led that, but there, were, there was a lot of other factors. So it felt to us, and we were launching our own growth fund, trying mm -hmm. to make our own contribution mm -hmm. to kind of support the fledgling companies. Uh, with regards to the terms of trade, um, it, it, was, it was very much a sense that um, a regime that had been designed over a decade earlier mm -hmm. had, to, had to be revisited in some shape or form, and indeed subsequently was re revisited after I left. Um, and it was a time to start that discussion. My proposal at the time that was sort of, um, uh, I thought, rather a good one, was, and Mark Thompson had raised this as well, was, was the retransmission fee uh, discussion. Uh, and I had said that we could invest all of the potential money from retransmission uh, fees back into the indie, indie sector. I made mm -hmm. that commitment. And part of the quid pro quo was, but let's look at terms of trade because we're going to have to be more flexible. Um, and look, I understand that it wasn't necessarily a popular thing to say, but it was in the context of a broad mm -hmm. range of ideas, which included the whole coming discussion about defending the PSBs and defending Channel 4 in particular. We'll, we'll come on to that, we'll spend a bit of time on it. F just quickly on consolidation, do you feel as though um, creative businesses uh, struggle or can struggle when business factors come and change their ownership and perhaps Enmeshed them in. They can, they can, and I think I, some of the probably least popular things I said in that speech were about my experience of working for Americans. Because, you know, the, Brits, the British creative culture is very distinct, and um, the American creative culture is brilliant, but the American corporate culture, combined with the British creative culture, is, can be problematic. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I was sort of pointing that out a little bit. Of, um, but, but the process of companies being sold and consolidated, it wasn't, it wasn't an ideological point at all. It was more careful what you wish for. The hit shows go into these big consolidators and they keep moving and keep being exploited as they should be. Um, but then you do need to replenish and that was why the growth fund mattered to me because it was about where's the next wave coming from because it's often the next wave that's producing the next wave of ideas. Very good. We'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, Privatisation. So... The government's point of view was privatisation, not on the agenda. That was their public point of view. A photograph, a, a leaked, uh, well, no, it wasn't a leaked photograph. It was a photograph of an official walking into or out of Downing Street that, that long, long lens zoomed in, told us otherwise. So there was a period where the privatisation of Channel 4 was a very real prospect. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it was described to me by historians of Channel 4 as the most serious... Um 
campaign to sell the channel in its history, and there had been two or three previous to that. Um, I mean, Margaret Thatcher had set, set the channel up with a brilliant remit to promote the independent sector, to create competition. Um, so in, in my book, it was a very entrepreneurial idea from the get-go. So <coughs> people get confused with sort of their perceptions of Channel 4 News and where we are in the current um, political debates. But it was an interesting moment for me because there was a gear change. The coalition dissolved. We had a conservative majority and John Whittingdale became Secretary of State. And despite some very sort of reassuring noises for a few months, including Edinburgh that year, mm. um, we, we were on sort of, you know, we were kind of on, 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 on alert for, for what might uh, come. And my perspective on this now, because we're still obviously living with Brexit, is that sort of that was a very kind of quiet but important period of threat for the PSBs because of the way in which those that were promoting the referendum and promoting Brexit uh, were looking to exert influence over the PSBs editorially. And there was actually a letter that was written to Adam Crozier, Tony Hall and myself effectively a bit like a headmaster's letters giving us a warning about this concept of due impartiality in 2015. Specifically around the Brexit referendum? In the 12 months leading up to the referendum. That letter so came from? From John Whittingdale as Secretary of State to us as the leaders of the PSBs. And uh, if I were to paraphrase that letter as we're watching you? Sort of, yeah, due impartiality. So this whole notion of how one, one was obligated to sort of give equal uh, airtime to all points of view began then. And in parallel, sort of every weekend in the Sunday Times, there was, <laughs> you know, we're going we're gonna to review the BBC licence fee, we're going to privatise Channel 4, we're going to do this, that and the other. So there were massive amounts of distraction There was a lot of briefing going on. going on, wasn't there? There was a heck of a lot of going on. And then, of course, we saw what the outcome of the referendum was. I, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm just describing the facts of what was going on at that time. And did you have lots of personal interactions with John Whittingdale or other ministers? Or well, one, I, I'm interested in the extent how how combative were these well, interactions? One, once um, that leak happened, it was sort of the phony war was over. The phony war was yeah. over. Yeah. Um, by yeah, so by by Christmas we were we were there, and, and I had the added challenge of my chairman not being extended. So. Terry Burns. Right, yeah. So I was sort of an exposed CEO without a chairman with a process going on overseen by Ofcom to find a chairman who had to be chosen to either privatise Channel 4 or not privatise, we didn't know. Um, and again, just sort of fast-forwarding through the whole experience, I, I learned a lot about the difference between parliament and government, the executive and the legislature, which, of course, is now playing out very centrally because I... It is always possible for, in my view, common sense to prevail if you can take your arguments to Parliament and to MPs of all persuasions and to the House of Lords, which we then spent the next two years doing. But the House of Lords were broadly supportive of Channel 4. And it's, it's they, they were, but I mean, again, it wasn't ideological. We had to provide a lot of evidence mm. for, OK, if you decide to privatise Channel 4, you cannot have the delivery of this entire remit and then here are the numbers to prove it, but, because here is what is we are doing with the, as it were, profitability of the schedule to fund things which are not profitable. So if you want to do Film 4, if you want to do the news and dispatches at this scale, this is effectively what the profit is going on. Mm. So if you want to deliver a profit to a private owner, this is what I would have to do to change the schedule. So we just laid out the analysis, and for all the neutral um, observers in, in Parliament, and many of them in government, they looked at it and went, oh, OK, because it was funny, you had to re-educate people mm. as to how the thing actually worked. Mm. Um, you battled pretty hard on privatisation. It was a long battle. It was a battle you won. Do you think that you spent so long in battle mode fighting the privatisation battle that when the question changed to relocation you were sort of stuck in that, in that battle mode? It's definitely something that people have, um, have said. Um, and, you know, again, I'm not the historian of, the, of that period. Other people will, will write that up. But uh, what was actually going on behind the scenes is once it switched, once Karen Bradley... I mean, again, we remember we were in a, a weird period where we went into another election, mm. um, 2017, mm. 
and there was a manifesto, and the manifesto said, we will not privatise Channel 4, few, but we will forcibly relocate the entire organisation. And Andy Street was in Birmingham, uh, making it quite obvious that he'd had a nod and a wink, and the whole of Channel 4 would be forcibly moved to Birmingham. So that was the, those, are the, those, those are the circumstances of the 2017 election, mm -hmm. which unsurprisingly led me to go, well, that's very interesting, but no one's come to see me or talk to the board about that. Um, so um, we, after that election, entered into a conversation about the possible, the art of the possible. Mm -hmm. um, and in actual fact, there was an awful lot of work done. By then, I had decided that it was time to move on. Um, and I worked as diligently as I was able to to provide all of the, like, the toolbox of analysis mm -hmm. that, um, that Alex and her team subsequently uh, used to make the decisions that they made after I left. It possibly wasn't unhelpful that... Uh, a new CEO could come in and pick up that challenge. You'd done seven years. You'd fought your battles with yeah, government. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think they've done a brilliant job in following through on it. Um, and I've got... Do you think... What, what's your take on the outcomes they, 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 they I think, I think, I think I think it's, it's, been, um, it's been bold and it's been true to the principles that no, I, no one was arguing against. I or the board was arguing that more regional representation both on and off screen was a good thing. I had tabled the idea of a 50% uh, spend level um, phased over time. I had been an analysing and looking at with the team um, a significant relocation of parts of the organisation. The thing I was very vocal on was forcibly moving the whole organisation was idiotic. Uh, and I'm very pleased at that. That, that didn't happen because I think Channel 4 is quite a delicate thing. The interaction between sales and marketing and content is carefully stitched together and I, I felt that you know disrupting that wholesale was going to be... And then, of course, the whole issue of how many people would stay. And, <laughs> and, and so um, I think, you know, in the circumstances, I think what's happened is, has been a good outcome. Um, and the, the, some of the challenges that face Channel 4 now are the same challenges it it faced in, in your era. Channel 4 is a domestic broadcaster in an increasingly global content market, and it's a publisher broadcaster in a market that's vertically integrating. So how confident are you about, you, it comes up every decade by your reckoning, the, the future of C4? What's your, what's your take on the, the, the health of C4 as we move into the 2020s? Well, C4 still operates with a a kind of significant amount of real estate um, in the national consciousness and is still commissioning a material amount of original content on a not-for-profit remit that allows it to take creative risks. So it's, its relationship with the indie sector, which is very strong, and its ability to take those risks and find new great um, creative ideas in multiple genres, from mm -hmm. scripted to documentary and using current affairs, is still, in my view, very potent. Um, and yet, the, you know, the competition is, it showed, shows no sign of abating, and so there's much more agility required, and much more, uh, even more um, breakthroughs in, in, the, in marketing that content mm -hmm. and associating the core brand proposition with that. So nothing gets any easier. It is hard, but people said I was pretty mad to do the job in 2010. So I just think there's a new set of challenges that have to... It seems to, to me that you fundamentally believe that if Channel 4 makes great shows, then it can be successful. That's a large part of it. Um, and, I, and I still think the indie sector in the UK is capable of delivering those shows. Very good. Particularly but, Wanderhood Studios. Let's, <laughs> what, a in, what an incredible segue uh, to your current, current venture. Where, where were you pitching today, David? I did actually go for the second time in two years to Channel 4 today. Beautiful reception. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, they've redone the cafe. It's nice, isn't it? Um, what's Wonderhood Studios, David? There's plenty of indies out there. Why does the world need another one? Well, um, I've been incredibly fortunate in being able to attract some brilliant creative people. So, you know, that's more than half the battle. Um, uh, and we have, a, we, have a, we have a different take on, on what's going on. We 
we are we are currently an unscripted production company with four slash five things now going into production, and one that we're going to be able to share a bit with you tonight. Um, but we're also a creative agency um, run by a really talented uh, group of people, one of whom is here, Aidan McClure, who was the creative director at, B at the BBC. Um, and so we are developing relationships with brands where there is a sort of strong sense of purpose and where brands are looking to take mo migrate from sort of, I suppose, interruptive paid media mm -hmm. into partnerships through content. Um, and this thing that just flashed up here was something we did a few weeks ago at the England game where uh, England was celebrating the, the thousandth England game to have occurred since the 1880s, since the start of the, uh, uh, the team. And Nike wanted to shine a light on the 93 players who'd ever played for England uh, that were black. And so we've got the first ever to play and then the most recent recruit. And this was surrounded Wembley on, the, on that night when they played Montenegro, which of course was a, a problematic game when they played the away game. So it was, a, it was an attempt to do something really positive. There are many brands out there that are looking to do cause-related, purpose-led mm. activity and work with content providers. Public service ways. advertising. Well, it, it's partnership. I'm a bit it's, it's partnership, <laughs> isn't it? It's yep. partnership. It's like, what is the purpose of a brand and how can it uh, communicate it in a, in a really original way? Also, because of these restrictions on linear TV that have emerged and the amount of attention that's going into streaming media, uh, it, the media agencies are looking for new ways to create partnerships, and there's some really exciting, mm. interesting new... You can't reach eyeballs on Netflix, can you, if you're an ad agency? You can't, but then, you know, F1, which is one of our early jobs we did, at, we helped F1 launch that series, the, the marketing of the series. I mean, F1 is a highly branded property, um, which part, and I think there's more and more content that's, that's going onto Amazon and onto that's Netflix that, that is in yep. that sort of co-funded space. Yeah, that's interesting. So the theory of Wonderhood is you have the creative agency, you have the traditional production um, uh, uh, TV production side of things, but the theory is that these areas can also cross-pollinate, and that's sort of the, yeah. the one of the USPs. You've got these two arms; they're off doing their own thing, but you're kind of hoping for a bit of alchemy. Yeah, they the cross-pollinate two ways. One is because, uh, yeah, bluntly, we're 20 people sitting in one room, so we're helping each other. We, you know, the ad team can develop, um, help brainstormings on the development of TV programs, and and vice versa when we're pitching for brands. So that's the, sort of the organic nature of it. That's the people base side of it. But we are also developing projects where brands are effectively commissioning us mm -hmm. to come up with long, well, me, mid and long form content. And with the emergence of platforms like Quibi, you know, th there is more and more focus going on storytelling that, you know, commercials are brilliant in very short, you know, bites, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, maybe 90 seconds. But telling a story once you're at three to five minutes, mm -hmm. it's actually a different muscle that you're using and it's much more relevant therefore to take the storytelling of program makers and bring it closer together um, but always with the lens of it's got to be really original and good and high quality we're not an AFP agency we're not doing product placement it is it is high quality content that audience will, will love. Should we quickly have a look at something you did for Comet Relief? Yes this was um, uh, just been voted one of the 10 best ads of the year by Campaign magazine um, but what is it? Is it an ad? Is it a short film? It's beautiful. Let's have a look. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
It was the first thing Comic Relief had ever done that wasn't humorous. Yeah. <laughs> but it cut through. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that was both an ad and it was also shown, shown on the night um, of the broadcast back in March. They, they were planning and assuming that Brexit was going to happen like the, in the week of Comic Relief, so they were thinking a lot about the mood yeah. of the country. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so you've just recently secured some investment for Wonderhood. Yes. What's that going to allow you to do? Um, well, first of all, I have to thank my new investor who's sitting there in the audience from Calculus, who created a brilliant 20 million fund that's going to support uh, companies like Wonderhood to grow. And it, it's interesting for me to be now uh, receiving investment, having seen companies like Whisper and Eleven and Renowned and True mm -hmm. North and uh, Whisper do so well out of the Channel 4 growth fund, which is, which is great to see. So I think this whole thing about replenishing and creating new waves uh, in the industry is really important. Uh, for us, it, it uh, creates some extra headroom for us to begin to look at um, hybrid pieces that could be in the, in the drama documentary mm -hmm. space or potentially even in the, in the drama space. But um, like any growing business, you, 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 know, you, you need resources to keep um, talented people coming in and keep, keep, keep the pipeline going because we've, uh, we've, we've got an amazing development team in the company. Um, you know, one is sort of seeing ideas uh, very strong and original ideas going out to to the buyers, both in the UK and hopefully internationally uh, in the year ahead. Uh, and all of that requires uh, resources. So it's great to have that extra headroom. Very good. And your ambitions then for, for, for Wonderhood? Look, my ambition for everything I've ever done is to do great work. And I think, you know, it's, it's a different kind of mouse trap, um, and it hopefully is going with the grain of where the market is going, and it will help to bring um, funding into, into high-quality content in a slightly new way. It's a, it's a creative business that's independent but has a bit of a stabilizer on it because it has two revenue streams it can mm -hmm. rely on. And we also use quite a lot of data insight as well to sort of inform and guide um, what we're doing on both sides of the business. So I think I'd like to prove that that model is, 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 is well-timed and helps to create more original ideas. At the end of the day, I've always been in businesses that if, uh, if the ideas are original, um, then um, it's good for business. Very good. And you've got, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up now before I come to the, uh, the, the, the audience. You've got a bit of a, a slate. You've got a handful of projects with a few different PSBs. Where, where, where it, where's Wonderhood Studios at in terms of its... The, the business that you've won from the from the so, broadcasting um, space. So our fir our first show that we're going to show a clip from um, is going on BBC Two uh, at the end of Master Chef on the nineteenth of uh, of December. Um, it's a it's a wonderful um, documentary that's been created by Samantha Rancis, who's creative director, uh, leads that team brilliantly. Uh, who's in the edit tonight, finishing it off with Patrick Holland. Um, but we think there's something very special about this that could become a series, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's a sort of hybrid of, um, of um, uh, a sort of uh, immersive history, but set in the food space, and it features Heston Blumenthal. Uh, yesterday, we announced that we're doing a history of Donald Trump's presidency as told through his Twitter account, um, <laughs> and the team are about to go and start shooting that on Monday in America for BBC Three. And again, we're hoping that, that might find, we might find a new way for television to, <laughs> to sort of do biography through Twitter, mm -hmm. which could be really fun and interesting. Um, and then we do have a Channel 4 project, which is not yet announced, but it's in the, in the medical documentary space. And um, we've got some very advanced development going with, uh, with BBC One and with Channel 5 as well. So we're busy uh, at the end of, or going into year two. Um, you know, we've been through that period of gestation and now things are going into production, so it's exciting. And on a personal level, going from running an organisation with 800 staff and dealing with government departments and projected ad revenues and all those kind of things to, to running well, a, a small startup? It's still a business and you've still got to look at the P&L and, and make sure there's cash in the bank. Don't let anyone uh, privatise Wonderhood, OK, that's it. Um, that's not going to happen anytime no. soon. But it's Has it been on a personal level? Doing on that? a personal level, it's just been a whole new chapter um, working with Sachin Dasani, our business partner, who's, who's, 
been brilliant, and, and we've I've just you know we've created new relationships, new teams, and working with a lot of younger people directly in the office every day, which is really fun, and you know it's it's got a certain amount of um, buzz and and and, uh, and the unknown about it. You know, it's a new adventure, it's a new chapter, and it's it's a lot of fun. Very good. Why don't we watch the clip, and then I shall come to the audience with some questions. Heading to a restaurant that changed the course of my life. In 1982, on a rare foreign holiday, 15 year old Tesla came with his family to eat at the Saint Charles Saint Lucien, the Roman Air. But it wasn't just the beautifully prepared food. So what we do in the show is we uh, reassemble the original team for the Fat Duck from 2001, uh, who are all around the world now, super chefs in their own right, and we challenge them to recreate the menu that they invented in 2001 in a tiny little kitchen in the Fat Duck. And the kitchen in the Fat Duck is now huge and really high tech, and we shrink it back to its original form. And they have to basically recreate the menu and cook it for a group of people who are well known from that year. So we've created a format that combines immersive history and food and, and memory and seemed apposite for an evening like this, Chris. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, I sometimes find a fiver down the back of my sofa, not an, o, not an OBE, but um, no, fantastic, very good. I'll never have an OBE, that's for sure. <laughs> not if Mr Whittingdale's got anything to do with it. Um, <laughs> We've got, we have got some time, I think, to, to, to have some questions from the, from the audience. Fantastic, some arms going up. So, we were, we were first, so why, don't, why don't we go to uh, one at the back, please, um, and then we'll come... Actually, we'll start here, because the microphone is here, and then, and then we'll come to you at the back. So, please, please do begin. 
Hiya, it's been really interesting hearing you talk as somebody who I would hope looks quite young, <laughs> and is young. I was wondering, as uh, you've sort of started a startup in sorts, if you had any advice, particularly for younger people, uh, you know, looking to do similar things or anything you sort of learned in your first year of kind of running solo, so to speak? Uh, of, of, of Wonder Host Studios? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, I think you've just, just focus on what really excites you. And it, for me, it's always been to have the opportunity of working with people who, who've got original ideas and are producing, uh, telling stories in different ways. You know, that, that is just an eternally fascinating thing to be involved with. It's got to work as a business as well. It's got to, you've got to find a way of making that sustainable. And, and you never quite know, because the most extraordinary creative things can create amazing economic value, but it, it's difficult to predict. So living with that uncertainty, but fo stay focused on quality. That's the most important thing. Thank you. Very good. And at the back. David, thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, the, the, your, career, your long career and the things you've said uh, show you to be a consistently... Um, market conscious and um, globally conscious creative. And so my question is, what markets are you, um, it, are you personally excited by markets that are not Anglo-American? Of course, Anglo -Amer the Anglo-American ecosystem is, is a behemoth and quite understandably so. But I was wondering whether you know, there's anything out there that you are, uh, places uh, and markets that you're excited, of, excited about in terms of original content in those places or of e export opportunities for our own content. I, Obviously, I'm alluding to you know things like South Asia, East Asia, but also recently with the um, uh, folks at Water Presents um, setting up stuff like Eagle Eye. I mean, do you have any thoughts about that? All of that. I love the Water Presents guys. Um, I think what they've done is amazing. Um, you're right. My my career has sort of been transatlantic, um, and the world's changing very very fast. So I do. I, I am, and I have been on a couple of sort of missions. I'm fascinated by the possibilities of, of Asia, particularly in the space that Wonderhood's operating in, because the relationship between uh, content and, and sort of brand funding uh, is much more fluid um, than it is um, in, in, in the UK um, currently. Uh, and that's not just a regulatory thing, I think it's a technological thing and a cultural thing as well. So I, I think, you know, what I, I would hope is that um, having established our model and got it moving um, uh, over the next year or two, that it's quite possible that a Asia might be sort of, sort of an earlier uh, place that we would explore the application of our model than, than, than many of the sort of Western uh, countries. That's quite possible. Very good. Some more questions? We've got, f fantastic, over here, and then we'll come to Kate and then Gentlemen, Hello. Um, sounds like it's been a little while since you were last in the ad game. I'm just wondering what changes you might have noticed in that industry since you've been back. So lots of lot is is very different because digital obviously is far more central in terms of what, how clients spend money than they they did when I left the business over 20 years ago. But weirdly, I think that creates an opportunity as well because I think there's been a sort of over shift towards. Um, Sort of what's you know mechanistic marketing um, as opposed to uh, marketing based on big brand ideas. So I think our model should be well positioned to sort of catch that. Um, also, a lot of marketing uh, directs to themselves um, and their relationships with CEOs is very different to what I remember. Um, I think a lot of the agency relationships that existed 20 years ago were more at the CEO level. Um, and therefore the bigger, bolder bets were taken with big creative ideas. Uh, and I think the industry has sort of put, found itself being pushed, or parts of it have been pushed downstream. Although, interestingly, the big companies like WPP and Publicis, I think, do have seats at the top table. And so uh, the challenge for a startup like Wonderhood is to find ways to work with, uh, with CEOs who are doing interesting things. So we're very excited that we uh, recently were... Uh, assigned a, an important project for a new bank called Starling Bank, and we're working pretty directly with the CEO and her team uh, on a new mobile banking uh, proposition. And that's 
back to what I would remember to be a really strong kind of relationship where you can kind of work together at a senior level um, and create big, bold ideas. Very good. So we're going to give it Kate, and then we can go to the chat. Yeah. So, hi, David. Uh, it's Kate Bulkley. So uh, the big question I have is sort of, with your experience, look at the PSBs now. They're under a lot of pressure. We're seeing them do interesting things like partner with each other, a um, lot of co-productions. Is it enough, you know, data? But is it enough? How, what do you see the future of PSBs being? And how do they get out of this problem of just being relegated into maybe ghettoized into doing, I don't know, certain kinds of content, maybe just news? Is, is partnering enough? How do they stand up, particularly now that everybody's going D to C? The Look, big guys. I, I, the PSBs are first and foremost cultural institutions for this country. And I think they remain massively influential. I mean, it's, it's funny, isn't it? The, we were talk, talking earlier about the role of the newspapers in driving the discussion around the election, even though everyone says the newspaper is a broken industry. Yeah. Um, so I think you need to differentiate between sort of cultural significance and then the business models that can help support that, which are more challenging. Uh, than, than they ever have been, no, no doubt about it. I mean, look what Mark Thompson said. He said that we're, you know, the cultural problem. I mean, if you let, if you let the big guys take you over, yeah. there will be no British culture. There yeah. will be no French culture. Yeah. It's pretty cool to do that when you're running the New York Times, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Come back for your victory lap. Um, uh, um, Touche. The, the, no, I, I think... Um, I, I really do think that the, the BBC, Channel 4, ITV have the ability to, to keep uh, producing and being known for globally extraordinary content and storytelling and journalism. Um, you know, look at the effect of Cambridge Analytica on the global conversation around Facebook. So I just don't, I don't see any diminution in that ambition or that power or that ability. I just see... Um, a fraying of the economics to, 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 to continue to take those risks. And I think I also see a weakening of political will around the licence fee potentially being an issue which has to be guarded against. Because I still think that if you know, the British population were to have a referendum about the BBC, it would be one ninety ten or 95. Because everyone... No one's arguing about the value of the, of the BBC. We're just arguing about some of the mechanics and this trope around the licence fee can't survive another round. I've never bought that. I, I have always felt that. Um, I ju just look, look at the lives we're living. Look at, look at the absorption we have of, of, of the radio stations and, and, and the common and, 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 and the national discourse around what the PSBs are doing. It's still really, really strong. I know the maths appears to contradict that completely and young people aren't watching, da 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 but I, there's something instinctively that says we ought to be wary of rushing to generalisations when, you know, whether it's in film, whether it's in drama, whether it's in journalism, th there's just it's still extraordinary, just look what's happened with the, the whole Prince Andrew thing. I mean, you know, it, it's not occasional, it's, it's, it's constant, that power. Thank you. That's good. We've got a, we've got a couple of... Uh, Chaps here's got a, a, a microphone, and then we'll come to you at the, at the back. Hi, David. Um, just a question for you. I'm making the, the transition from content creation to content ownership. Have you got any advice, any tips for me? And you're thinking of going which direction? Content ownership, so like making uh, documentaries, films, TV formats. That's right. Listen, you, you, it's what we were saying earlier. You've got to go with your, your instincts and go with the stories that you want to tell uh, and surround yourself with people who, who you can learn from and to, say those, to tell those stories in the, in the most powerful way possible. Um, so, you know, you being here tonight, being part of this industry and connecting with the different educational and, and training uh, programs that exist are all part of the the journey that you'll go on. It's that combination of learning and doing that we all have to do throughout our lives and um, that I'm still very much doing. Very good. At the back. Yeah, David, I was going to ask you a question about your McTaggart lecture. I think five years ago you talked about the, 
the threat of the globalization of British TV, or globalization on British TV, and in particular the threat from uh, American corporates. And I was just wondering, five years on, whether you're sort of more or less concerned about the impact of the likes of Netflix and Amazon on British TV. Am I more or less? I mean, where I was coming from in that speech wasn't to say that um, it was good versus evil or that, you know, it, that, that w it was really to do with the balance and the mixed ecology and the health of that ecology um, and where Channel 4 fitted in as a, uh, into the mixed ecology and was there balance in the system. So I, I, I think as long as there is sort of the political kind of framework holds around the PSB system and what needs to happen now around EPG prominence and all of the other things that I know are, are, are a focus of attention. As long as we, we, we keep reforming that system from a, a set of principles that everyone buys into, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm no less or no more um, uh, fearful about, about, about the threat. Um, it's very clear that what Netflix have done in a very exception, exceptional way is demonstrate the power of quality and investment, um, which has been to the benefit of UK producers as, as well and has raised the bar. And so, you know, they've added to that ecology in a way that has, has, has been quite extraordinary. Um, and weirdly created um, other parts of the... Of the, of the environment that have been less dominant than they otherwise would be. And I'm thinking slightly of Sky there, that you know, Sky are, are no longer the gorilla. Uh, and so you're getting some very interesting and positive alliances between Sky and Channel 4, for example, that I tried to float, but very prematurely at the time, given how the ecosystem was working then. So it's always that whole thing of, you know, your enemy and your friend and things shifting. So again, an agile player like Channel 4 can shift in lots of interesting new ways as they continue to uh, in order to keep um, the brand relevant and, and the content fresh. So I, I, I think it just, it's good to be vigilant and it's good to, be, to, to have glass half full, full as well as empty and be concerned. And I think the regulators need to continue to be on this. Uh, because I think there was a period in that 2015 thing that we went through mm. where it was almost like, oh, well, of course the licence fee is going to go and, of course, Channel 4 can't survive. You know, it's almost like that, that rhetoric became quite dangerous and I think we've got to sort of definitely put the markers back in and say, no, this system is here to stay. Let's keep innovating and let's keep reforming it. Fantastic. We've got some more questions. I'm conscious. How are we for time? One more? One more question down here. Question, no pressure. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, really interesting. I, I'm interested in particularly how you positioned your new, your new company. So, I came from a background of marketing, and I moved into TV a few years ago. And that whole idea of, of coming from a branded content idea or proposition or work, and coming into TV, uh, it was almost a bit like you know, we talk about the marketing side of what you used to do. And I wonder if you were. Um, you know, I think it's very, it's fantastic. You know, Merman also re recently launched a few years ago a commercial arm to what they're doing. Yeah. And it's also almost maybe less ashamed that I used to do marketing as well. So the fact that you're out there saying this is what you do, I was very interested in your quote a minute, a minute ago, the relationship between content and brand funding is much more fluid now. And looking at how the different markets are looking at um, uh, using content and how they are embedded together. So um, my question really is how you are, how much, what you thought or how much time it took you to, a lot of time, I'm sure, but how you thought about positioning your organisation and were, whether or not you always were clear that you were going to have that, that the connection between the two areas, or were you trying to be persuaded by some to be purely TV and to kind of move away slightly from the market? It's, it, that is a, it's a really insightful question because, of course, you can have a theory, but you have to make it work in practice. So we're only a year in, and there are many examples where, for example, Aidan's come up with ideas for TV shows that Sam has been developing with broadcasters and where we've taken some of Sam's thinking into brands to talk about maybe access documentaries. So there's a lot of fluidity in an informal way. Um, but we have, I can show you a TV show, I can show you an ad. Next year, I, I hope to be able to show you the product of the two teams actually blending the skills to create a product um, that sits out there on a platform or on a broadcaster, but it operates in a new way. because. 
it's, the challenge has been, oh, you're talking about product placement, aren't you? Or you're talking about um, ad-funded programming, and we're talking about something quite different. And there are great examples out there. Patagonia are making extraordinary documentaries. Nike have been doing some amazing things. When it's a great idea and you do it full throttle and you're really entertaining and engaging audiences, people, there's no barrier but it's got to have that ambition to it to make it work. And to your early point about marketing and the, the snobbery, and you touched on it earlier, I think that's gone. I think that's gone. I mean, there are so many movie studios that are run by people. You know, the guy who, who ran HBO came from a comms background. He's now done a massive deal with, with Apple. You know, so I, I actually think that's sort of almost like a probably a 20-year-old 20, 20 myth. Rather, It's not been around for a very long time. I think you've just got to be good um, and, 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 and marketing has a transformational effect when, and we saw it with the Paralympic Games, with Superhumans, with Stand Up to Cancer. When marketing is that good, it lifts the content and, then the con and vice versa and then the content reflects the marketing and you get this fusion which is how all of these services ultimately have to differentiate themselves. If they can't identify what their core purposes are and if they can't express it in imaginative ways, then you get very undifferentiated linear channels that just will fade away in this new environment. So it ups the stakes to do this really well uh, and for linear channels to, to succeed. Very good. On that positive note, I think we have run out of time. Uh, please join me in thanking David for his time. <laughs>